In 2006, the League received funding from the New York Community Trust for a six-week course in how to run for public office. The student body was a wonderful, diverse community. We had 25 to 30 students in every class. But once we got the funding, we had to find the faculty. We were very lucky in two of our own who said they would serve. <coughs> Laura Altula, who gave the course on debate techniques, and Adrian Kivelson on getting out the vote. Adrian doesn't realize that her work is endless. Debates go on, but getting at the vote, the mountain gets higher and higher and higher. But then uh, we needed other people to fill in the faculty. Allison Alfred was our executive director at the time, and she and I went hunting. And I had constantly seen the name Doug Musio in the newspapers. We called, and we went down to see him at his offices at CUNY, and he agreed to do it. The first time I introduced him at the, Burr President, at the Burr of Manhattan Community College, I said he was often quoted in the New York Times. Well, he had come with a colleague, Scott Levinson, who was a political consultant. Scott, who has no problem interrupting anybody, <laughs> and interrupted me and said, the most quoted academic in the New York Times. <laughs> and, and, and he has been, and he is wonderful. And his background, as you read in our invitation, covers the waterfront. It also includes being elected to one of the most highly contested offices in our nation, that of school board in New Jersey. <laughs> this is not so. The, 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 this is what you did. The academia you will read about, I, I, he is now in the midst of writing another book. And I just feel that we are so fortunate that he is going to tell us what happened and what will happen. And if he doesn't, we'll have him back again. So, Doug, thank you. Well, I, want, I want to thank the League for inviting me. I've got a long association with, I can't use a mic, so forget the mic. So why didn't you tell uh, me? Long association with the League, I guess my first association was with Laura when I worked for uh, WABC and we did the, the, the debates for the campaign finance board, and then as Gladys said, taught in a number of running for whatever it is, offices, and Adrian and I go back longer than we would care to admit. Uh, so I'm honored to be here, and I've done this, I've done this, this gig before. I know you've paid 12 bucks to eat. That's, hopefully you got 12 bucks worth of food because what I'm about to deliver is what they're paying me. <laughs> So what, what, I, what I'd like to do is, uh, Gladys suggested that I, you know, so rant and rave for 20 minutes, open it up to the floor, and mutually rant and rave with you folks. <laughs> and she proposed a couple of questions which I'll address. But let me, a little quiz, I'm a professor. How many of you have ever witnessed a weirder mayoral campaign than the one we just went through. Raise your hand, come on. There's nobody. You, you, went, you saw a weirder one here? If you ask me, I don't remember the year. Go ahead. Who? Who won? Who won what? Okay, that's an Abbott and Costello routine. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the, the 1969 election where Lindsay loses the Republican nomination to John Markey and the Democrats nominate Mario Procaccino, but those people were relatively sane. <laughs> you may not have liked them and you may not have voted for them, but they, you know, they, they weren't nuts. This election season was bizarre, obviously. I think that the two names that stick in my mind that will forever stick in my mind or Wiener and Spitzer. Oh, no. <laughs> Excuse me, in some sense, they dominated the campaign. They sucked the air out of the campaign. They were the show. And in a sense, and then, you know, with other candidates as well, it was like real, real politicians of New York. We could do a sitcom. I mean, you've got Spitzer, you've got Wiener, you've got all kinds of characters in the sitcom. But sitcoms, even sitcoms need plots. So what has been the play of the plot so far? 
and where might we go now that we've come back? I guess we've come back from the second set of advertisements. I guess they're what? At uh, uh, 10 minutes after the hour, 20 minutes <coughs> after the hour, and 28 minutes we're after the hour. Ahead. So we're on the, we're, on the, we're on the third segment of the show, and that's the general election. So let's just briefly take a tour through what's happened and what's, what's and in a sense, what's the ground rules here? Well, in some sense, this election is about two tales. One is a tale of two cities. The, the, you know, the, the, the metaphor from Dickens that was adapted by any number of people, from <laughs> Freddie Ferrer to Bill de Blasio, etc. And then there's really a question of, is it really a tale of two cities or two tales of the same city? So in a sense, what we've got to do is we've got to look at two questions. One is, why did Bill de Blasio win the Democratic primary? In a sense, it boils down to that. And what is the, what is the general election contest going to look like? So one, certainly one of the factors that propelled de Blasio was his consistent argument that there was massive inequality in the city and that this inequality had multiple dimensions. It wasn't simply economic, even though if any, any objective look at the data clearly indicates that wealth income polarization is increasing. It's increasing along social lines, demographic not lines, geographic lines. And Bill was consistent, whether it was the economy and jobs, whether it was stop and frisk, whether it was public education. So there was a consistency in the message. There are a whole lot of other factors that went into his primary win, from Dante's Afro to Wiener's self-destruction. You just keep going on and on. And all of these factors are important. But I think that the ultimate important element is what's going to play out in the general election, and that is this notion of real inequality. Then the question becomes, can the messenger deliver on the message? Can, I guess the question out there now among, you know, the chattering class is, can Bill de Blasio govern? The expectation is that de Blasio is going to win. If you look at the latest Quinnipiac poll, they've got some hugely absurd 50-point lead, but Lode has shown nothing in the general election. I mean, his general strategy was, I guess, three words, two phrases. One is class, no, four words, two phrases. Uh, one is class warrior, and the other is David Dinkins. That's the bumper sticker of the Lota campaign, that Bill de Blasio is a bomb-throwing Bolshevik. Hence, the attack that Bill de Blasio helped the Sandinistas. I mean, in a sense, it was the commification of Bill de Blasio. What do we have? We don't have much, and let's throw it up against the wall. Now, the, the, the test of all that was that the New York Post on its editorial page, which is not particularly fond of Bill de Blasio, <coughs> and, you know, rabidly pro-loader, or at least rabidly anti-de Blasio, on its editorial page said that Bill de Blasio was not going to make New York City Managua. So even, <laughs> e even Loder's most staunch media supporters are sending him a message, you've got to step up your game. If this is your game, give it up. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had the dialogue that we might have and ought to have over substantive matters. For example, what are the world views of these candidates? What, what, is, what is Joe Lotus' tale and what is Bill de Blasio's tale? Well, we have, we have a sense of what Bill de Blasio's tale is, but we really don't know what Joe Lotus' tale is because the campaign so far and the candidate have been extraordinarily unproductive. There's been no movement. There's been no development of narrative. Essentially, they know one thing, and that is, and it's very essential. I mean, I do political strategy. You've got to take de Blasio down. But at the same time, you've got to take him down. 
you've got to, you've got to present a positive image. Now, has anybody seen the latest blow to ad, well, the first ad of the general election campaign? He mentions Bill de Blasio five, six times, and in a sense, the ad almost is, I'm Bill de Blasio, but better, or I'm even better than Bill de Blasio, which isn't really the type of campaign that you want to run. However, in terms of narrative, in a sense, Lotus got to take the Blasio strength and use it against them. You've got to do a little political judo. So in a sense, Lota's got to be the progressive in the, in the race. Lota's got to be the change agent in the race. Lota's got to argue, yeah, Bill de Blasio's got really good ideas, but they're pipe dreams. It ain't going to happen. And on top of that, a lot of his ideas aren't good. And they're going to lead back to the bad old days. And hence, you've got the David Dinkins remark that I issued earlier, that David Dinkins' administration is metaphorically seen to be a disaster and a time when New York City at least is at its modern worst. I mean, clearly, you know, the fiscal crisis of the 70s was worse, but even then, you know, and, and this is, I guess, not meant to be a pun, that David Dinkins, in a sense, is the bete noir of the piece, that this is the era that we don't want to get back to. So there's, a, there's, a, there's sort of a racial component to this as well, as well as a socio-demographic component. I think that Lode is running a 1990s campaign and earlier, and the demography of the city, the cultural, in a sense, the cultural DNA of the city is a little bit different than, than it was, or a lot different than it was. I mean, certainly, if you look at the potential electorate in 2013, and you go back to, forget about Rudy Giuliani in 1993, but even uh, Mike Bloomberg in 2001, this is a different electorate, different issue matrix, different concerns. And Lotus got to recognize that. De Blasio has recognized that. The question is, can the messenger convince the voters that he can deliver on the message? And there's still a little bit of Rorschach test about Bill de Blasio, just as there was a little bit of Rorschach test about Barack Obama. You project onto the candidate what you want to see, and I think there's an element of that as well. And one of the failures of the Lota campaign is not engaging de Blasio on matters of substance. It's a mistake. We need that to happen. We need a vibrant opposition. They're not, he's not providing it. So, that, that, that's in one sense one of the contests, and that is it's, 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 it's a tale of two cities, but it's also two tales of the city. One looks at the city as a city of inequality, increasing polarization, and loss of opportunity, and a sort of forward-looking, depending on your perspective, obviously, <coughs> forward-looking agenda to ameliorate some of those inequalities. Loda, on the other hand, is, and it's somewhat unfair to say that he's a candidate of the status quo because in some ways he's not. I mean, there are elements of the Bloomberg <clears throat> legacy and even his old bosses that Lode is not particularly comfortable with given his more libertarian bent on social policies. But running as Rudy Giuliani 2013 ain't going to work. Okay, so that's the mayor's race. Controller's race... Interesting, you had Elliot Spitzer and Scott Stringer, you had the entire media and political establishment really eviscerating Spitzer, whether you, he, he deserved it or not, they gutted him over and over and over again. If you read the editorial quote-unquote endorsements of Stringer, they weren't endorsements of Stringer as much as they were really eviscerations of Spitzer. I mean, you look at... The Times, the News, and the Post, yeah. and you look at their editorials, they're written almost for the press releases, the, the lit, the electronic lit. It, they were almost made to be used in a campaign. There was a concerted effort to get Elliot Spitzer, and he came pretty close. So the establishment sort of wins. The newspaper endorsements seem to work. You know, the labor mobilization behind Stringer seems to work. But that gets us to the next question, endorsements, whether by labor or the newspapers. I mean, 
the New York Times is batting low with an A-Rod. I mean, they're really, they, they, they ain't doing good and they don't even have injuries to blame for. I, I mean, you, you, you name their endorsements except for the universal outrage over Spitzer and excuse me, it's, it's a bit of a, a failure, certainly on the citywide level. Yeah. Unions, again, different. Democratic primary for mayor, they're split. You've got a real division of labor organizations among, well, it really four, the four major candidates, the Blasio, Thompson, Quinn, and, and, and John Liu, in fact. And, you know, you've got all kinds of interesting dynamics. Now, the, the, the second that the Blasio wins, meaning that the morning of election day, despite what Thompson was doing for a couple of days, <laughs> the, the unions immediately, you know, came running and de Blasio can expect all that institutional support. And presumably, unions still have some muscle that they can get out the vote, that they can spend money, and they've got the staffing to canvas voters and get them out to the polls. That may, I don't know about that. I, I, we'll, we'll have to see how, actually, how, how potent union endorsements actually are, but it looks as if the conventional wisdom is emerging that newspaper <coughs> endorsements are grossly overrated and essentially, at least in the New York context, context ineffectual or counter-effectual. In fact, the law of perverse consequences could be operating. All those SOBs in the media are telling me how to vote, so I'm vote going the other way. So there may be, irrespective of ideology, it just may be, you know, New Yorkers' knee-jerk contrariness, you know. They're telling me what to do. I'm not listening to them. I'm doing what I want. Sort of the teenager's approach to political reality. <laughs> now, the latest election is the, let's see, I, how, how am I doing with time? Are you keeping time? You have a lot of time? I have a lot of time, yeah. I hopefully I have decades. <laughs> and I usually talk in three hour increments, but come on. You haven't covered the length of the room. What? You haven't covered the length of the room. Well, I have to go back to the right. tables have and have everybody right. turn around. <laughs> okay, so we have Tish James winning the Democratic primary runoff. And in some ways, a very, very interesting. Race Number one, clearly it demonstrates the power of newspaper endorsements since they all endorsed Daniel Squadron and he got slaughtered. <laughs> so, so much for the Times, the News, and the Post in terms of weighing public opinion. It is a difference between losing. I mean, Spitzel lost, you know, it was pretty close. I mean, this was an old-fashioned stomp out. This is a blowout now. If you watched, as I did, Tish James's, and I'm not a New York City voter, and I try not, I, obviously I have my own thoughts about candidates, but I try not to be too overt about it. <coughs> I watched Tish James's uh, victory speech, and I was worried. If I were a de Blasio supporter, I might be worried about Tish James, because she came off awful hard, and I can understand that. I'm a pretty hard guy. I come from Queens. I grew up on the streets. I know you have to throw the fastball at the head. But man, she really, she sounded like a class warrior. She's almost playing into Loder's playbook. Now, if I'm Joe Loder and I'm desperate, so, you know, what's my campaign? And essentially it's a question. Are you going to elect the bomb-throwing, Bolshevik and the angry black woman. I don't know. I don't know. So the Tish James win says something. I mean, if you looked at uh, WNYC's interactive map on where the vote came from, and there were two colors on that map, too bad we don't have a computer, blue and, and green, and you look at where the Tish James vote came from and where the squadron vote came from, if you don't come to the conclusion that there are two cities, you're blind. If you look at it, there's clear geographical differences, and within those geographical dif uh, differences, there are socio extreme socio-demographic uh, differences, whether you're talking about race and ethnicity, whether you're talking about uh, income, education, etc. There are correlates there. There are and you look at their, their mean 
incomes or their per capita incomes, I don't care what economic measures you're using, you've got, and in fact, you've got more than two cities. I mean, you know, there's heaven, there's hell, and there's lots of purgatories, too. The problem with, I mean, you have to, you know, 12, 16 years of Catholic education it teaches me to think in those terms. Basically, what Phil de, de Blasio is arguing is that Purgatory shrinking. <laughs> the path to upward social mobility is, is blocked, if you will. Or it is not equally distributed in New York City and American society. I mean, it's, it's a more general left critique. And then we could go in, I'm not going to do it, but then we could talk about the rise of a new, new left with Elizabeth Warren and Bill de Blasio. We're not going there. <laughs> but, so where are we? We're, we're, we're on October 3rd. We're about a little bit about uh, less than a month away from the, no, a little bit more than a month away from the election. And what was really disturbing to me this morning, and I wake up disturbed. I wake up, <laughs> I wake up, I wake up pissed off at somebody all the time. And usually there's multiple somebodies. And my wife feeds into this, this because she's usually, angry at somebody, usually right-wing Republicans. She's got an ideological mind. But I wake up and I, I get ticked off. But this time I was ticked off at university, the media. The new Quinnipiac poll has, oh, I don't know, the Blasio up by 50. Clearly, you know, it's not 50. It may be 20. It could be 25 at this particular point. But Mickey Carroll, the director of the Quinnipiac poll, is an old, old friend of mine. He said that they should be, oh, the kid, the Blasio kid should be arguing on who gets the biggest bedroom at Gracie Mansion. <laughs> uh, yeah, but as a pollster, you don't want to be predicting the outcome of an election a month out. Strange things happen in politics. Politics is not only the art of the possible, but I've been around long enough, and some of you have been around long enough, to see the impossible happen frequently. So, come on. And as the, my, 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 my favorite uh, intellectual about leadership once argued, Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> that there were certain things as known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. <laughs> well, we know about the known knowns in this campaign. They're going to be the debates. And, you know, the, the, the known unknowns, the unknown knowns is that we don't know what the outcome of that is. And then there are the unknown unknowns, which is the skeletons falling out of the closet, whoever it is. And too often we've seen it. That lead ain't going to hold up. And to predict the election on the basis of a poll more than a month out, I, I don't know. I, friendship was not a consideration. I tweeted it this morning, and I've got all kinds of both positive and negative responses. I love Twitter, by the way. I, I become an addict. I mean, 140 characters, you know, it's really, it makes it, this is a digression, by the way. This, this is really an art form. I'm trying to teach my graduate students, as well as my undergraduate students, that in order to write effectively, you've got to be clear, concise, coherent, cogent, and compelling, and that's it. 140, and 140 characters, it's like a game. If you do words with friends or any of those anagram games, Forget it. This is great. To get in 140 characters, everything you want to say. So, I, you know, I cut out quotes and I write characters and I, it's very effective. So it's good practice for you in terms of your own thinking about things to try to do it in 140 characters. Otherwise, you're wasting our time. Okay. So you've got all of that going on. Now the question becomes, who gets the message out? Who connects with voters, and who gets the voters out. You've got to remember that in order to win an election, yeah, you have to have votes, but you, in order to get them, you need three things. Well, you need one thing. You need mom. Everybody, doesn't everybody need mom, Adrian? And mom is money, organization, and message. Or, in its more vernacular form, it's mommy. You need money, no, you need message, organization, and money, money, yesterday. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about money. I mean, money is the mother's milk of politics. If you don't have enough resources to get the message out, you're not going to win. 
So there's always a competition. It doesn't have to be an equal amount of financial resources, an equal <coughs> amount of ads, an equal amount of digital presence. One of the reasons why de Blasio, I think, won is he, he, he used a different election paradigm. He didn't mail a piece of mail, which is, according to the conventional wisdom, how you reach people, mail is, I, I, it's bad. Because how many pieces of mail did you get in your box, number one? 27,000, sometimes from the same candidate. So what happens is there's a, what I call the pissed off quotient. <laughs> After the sixth piece of mail, you, you, I, you know, I really hate this person. I'm not going to read their mail. They're obnoxious, and if they govern like they send me mail, I'm not voting for them. So there are a lot of perverse consequences that might work there. De Blasio didn't spend a penny on it, went very heavy digitally, and that's one of the interacting factors that caused him to win. So a thing go, looking down the line, when journalism, when I teach in the journalism school, at uh, CUNY, one of the questions that journalism students ask, okay, after the election, what are the stories out there that I can write? Sure, I'm going to write, you know, the horse race story. I'm, I'm even doing background. What was the dynamic of the election? But you got to look forward. What, what does it teach us about campaigning? What does it teach us about politics? Irrespective of the more immediate substantive issues, what is this guy going to do on January 1st? And it's going to be a guy and it's likely to be Bill de Blasio. So clearly we have very little inkling, really, about how Bill's going to govern. And one of the questions is, can he govern? Can he put together a team and a policy agenda that he can effectuate? And that's why if they're not putting together their transition team now, or at least the proto-transition uh, team, they better start doing it soon because this clock really moves fast. I worked in 1989. I was Dave Dinkins Research and Issues Director in the first mayoral campaign. And man, the time just, it just runs by you and all kinds of stuff happens. And there's really a fog of war. And if you're not thinking about governing and you're only thinking about winning, and we were in a close election. We were both in a close election in the primary and a close against Ed Koch, essentially, and a, a, a very close election against Rudy Giuliani in the general. Bill's got the luxury, even though he can't really take advantage of it, of having the opportunity to start putting this together. So if I were he, I would be talking to some outsiders outside the campaign to begin putting together a real transition operation, both in terms of issues, policies and personnel, and I will guarantee you that Mike Bloomberg will give whoever wins the best transition that that administration is capable of giving. I mean, I've been critical of Mike Bloomberg on a lot of things, but one thing you can be assured of, assured of this transition is going to be first rate. I know from commissioners, deputy mayors inside, that the mayor is adamant that this is going to be a model of transition. So. De Blasio better start thinking about this. So, I mean, clearly, anything I say about de Blasio is also true of Loda. However, the expectation is that, you know, Loda is not going to win. So I'm, I'm focusing on Bill because Bill's likely to be the next mayor of the city of New York. So that's enough of me. What about you? <laughs> yes? Who's going to be the next speaker of the city? Ah! 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 Who knows? <laughs> I'm very interested in this question because I was the moderator of the first forum, speaker forum in 2001, and then I moderated the, the second and only uh, second uh, speaker's uh, forum in 2005, and I'm trying to put together, and we'll put together, the Who third did you one. Do that for? I don't know. Who did you do that for? For the forum? The moderator. I did it, I did it, I did it, I, I did it outside. In 2001, I did it as a personal individual. It was asked by a number of people who were running that to actually, in fact, moderate. In 2005, us, meaning the School of Public Affairs, the Citizens Union, and the League of Conservation Voters conducted the, 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 the Speaker's Forum at Baruch. It was a wonderful event. There were eight people, and it was great. Oh, it was great. No, and it worked really well. We had eight people or eight candidates? Eight candidates. Oh, no, no. 
No, there ain't candidate. No, the, That's the room. I you meant. The room was packed. It was room 220 at Baruch, which is on the 14th floor of the vertical campus, and it's this huge room that holds 300 people, and every seat was taken. People were sitting on the floor, and they were lined up against the wall. The fire marshal had to turn people away. It's going to be a well-attended event. Now, let, let me get to your question. After all that preamble, you know, there are a couple of folks who have been widely mentioned and also have themselves dropped hints. So, and then there's speculation, does Chris, uh, uh, Tish James' election open an opportunity for a white guy <laughs> to become the speaker because you've got, you know, yeah, who the hell knows? I mean, this is all inside politics and it's going to be determined by essentially who can put together the 26 votes necessary to become speaker and that traditionally has involved the county leaders. So county leaders are going to have, Joe Crowley uh, is going to have an effect on that. Frank Sedio in Brooklyn is going to have an Im impact on this. So there's two kinds of approaches. One is what Bill de Blasio used in 2005 called the, uh, the council member strategy, where you go to individual council members and try to get them in your coalition. And Bill used that strategy, and Chris Quinn used the county leader strategy, and she won. So. Assuming again that de Blasio wins and you've got Tish James in the office, you have to ask yourself the question, what does the mayor want in terms of the speaker? I mean, this would be the first time since 1993 that you had a speaker and a mayor of the, of the same party, obviously. You always had, in a sense, certainly with, uh, with Peter Vallone, to a large extent, Gifford Miller even more so, and Chris less so, opposition to the mayor. And that, that you know, that, that, that ain't going to happen. I mean, de Blasio's going to use whatever influence he has in the council to get a speaker that is, you know, is his Chris Quinn, if you will, in terms of moving a legislative agenda. Now, who best does that? Who best gives you the the type of support that you need? Do we do it gender-wise? Do we, you know, do we need, do we need a woman now that Tish James has won? If, if Squadron would have won, in a sense, you would have needed a woman, clearly because of the lack of diversity. Uh, also, Tish James, in a sense, removes the absolute necessity of not only move, necessarily moving to a woman, but moving to a minority woman, if not a black woman. So there's all this stuff going on. So who do you have out there? Yeah. You've, got, uh, you've got Dan Garodnik, you've got Mark Weprin, you've got, and then, then you've got Melissa Mark Viverito, and then you've got a couple of other people who are mentioning around the edges, and there are other people nibbling, and you, you just don't know, it's too early yet. But it's going to be, there's going to be at least six or seven or eight people who are going to want that, even if they really know that they can't get it. When I sat at that podium and looked back and forth, a pretty reasonable group of people in 2005, but clearly some of them were not going to be the speaker. And by that time, it was clear, and I guess that was it, the third week in November that we did it last time, it was clear that it was a two-person race between de Blasio and Quinn. So that'll shake out. Jimmy Vaca is another name. There's all kinds of names being floated out. I Jalissa Ferraris. Inez Dickens? Yeah, I, I, Inez was out there, but now with the recent issues about uh, rent and uh, properties and the fact that Tish Change won, I think her stock is probably considerably lower than it was at one time. Yes? I'd like to go back to Loda a little bit because, um, you know, we're, still, we're talking about a city that's elected, uh, if not Republicans uh, outright, but titular Republicans for all these years, and the vote in the Democratic primary tends to be a more left oh, vote. Absolutely. So now yeah. we have this whole group of people who never voted yep. in the primary, yep. and we like managers in this city, and that's been... Yep, so that's got to be part of his message that, and his strategic calculation that Democratic primary voters are far more ideological and partisan than a general electorate. And that at, when, you, when you stir in non-primary Democratic voters, you stir in 
you know, the one in six folks who were Republicans, and then you stir in the independents, one could make a mathematical calculation that get X percentage of this vote, X percentage of that vote, etc. You could make an argument that Joe Loda can win. Joe Loda can win. Is he going to win? No. <laughs> but he can win. Go ahead. No, I, well, I think that he, when you really get down to the debates, Joe Loda is, doesn't have a reputation as being a bomb thrower. Right. Except he got in a fight with somebody in the MTA. Uh, and I think that... That's a punch you know, thrower. <laughs> punch thrower. <laughs> um, but I think, that, you know, I, I, I just feel that there's a complacency um, that it's a foregone conclusion. Right. And Loda is, if he, get, if he ever gets a message out there, is a candidate that could appeal to the people who like... In like some him. ways, if you had Joe Loda's resume, you yeah. should be a, a legitimate candidate. Maybe not a Rudy Giuliani or even a Mike Bloomberg, right. but a really legitimate yeah. candidate. I mean, the guy ran... Help, you know, ran the MTA. I mean, clearly he didn't make the trains run on time. The, the TWU did that, but he, he was good. He, he was a budget director. He was a deputy mayor, so on. But based on the resume, he's got a substantial resume. He's also got some interesting social ideas. I mean, he's left on the social issues. I mean, he's, he's you know, pro-abortion rights, pro-gay rights, essentially. He's a libertarian. So he's got that interesting combination of socially, you know, socially liberal, fiscally conservative, man, that should appeal to a lot of folks in, in the boroughs. And even, you know, a couple of people in Manhattan <laughs> left wing ideologues. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, yep, you're next. Okay. No, you're next. She's oh, here for you. you. That's how keep... What do you think of Ms. McCarthy? Which Ms. McCarthy? Yeah, Carolyn Blasi McCarthy? De Blasio's wife. Oh! Well, wait. Uh, it's right. It's right. It's right. Yeah. Right. Well, very early on, I opined, and this may be prescient or it may be just dumb luck. If you talk often enough, you say smart things. It's like the, you know, the infinite number of monkeys over an infinite num amount of time will type all the words of Shakespeare. This may be one of those. Didn't Ronald Reagan say something like that? Oh, please. He said a lot of the nonsensical things. But very early on, I thought that, that she could be really important because as a black woman, she had the potential of certainly cutting into Bill Thompson's black vote. And I thought that would be the case. Clearly, I think it was less she than Dante and his afro. But I think the cl it's clear that Bill de Blasio, in some ways, in very important ways, became the black candidate because of his marriage, his family, and the obvious attraction that they have for one another, irrespective of her prior gender preferences. This is, a, this is a loving family. And that comes through, and that was part of de Blasio's win. You've got all these other people out there, you know, either their wives are hidden or they're, they're shy, for example, uh, uh, Chris Quinn's uh, wife, you know, clearly she's a private person. But Bill de Blasio is a real family with real people, with real kids, with, and they're going to public school. So there was a reality in that as well. And I think she, she helped do that. And I think that, that she's, a little bit, uh, she's a little bit in your face and feisty is a plus. Except, of course, if she gets tagged stereotypically as another angry black woman. I mean, come on. You know, Michelle Obama, I mean, you know, angry black women are good. I like angry black. I like angry white women. I like any kind of women who are angry. But seriously, I mean, that's what's going to happen. I, it's, it's invariable. And that's the. Just one more thing. I have to rant and rave a little bit. One more. One more. What really ticked me off. I mean, we're really getting into brass tacks here. What really, excuse me, pissed me off. Oh, I like that. Was the the just the unbelievable sexual stereotyping that went on in this campaign. I think Chris Quinn was a victim of real, not that she lost because of it, but I think that she was looked at through real 
sexist stereotype lenses. You know, that front page story in the Times saying that she yelled and screamed and they had to put in sound things. And the way they covered, if you go back and just go, I don't even remember the day, I think it was a Sunday, when she declared her candidacy, what the reporters focused on, and then just looking through the lens, okay, you know, let's look at gender here and how they're describing it. I mean, who gives a shit what she's wearing? Or how loud she is. I mean, do they do that with men? No. Yeah, so there's a clear, I think it's a pattern with public women generally that there is at least an implicit stereotypic lens through which a lot of us and the media look through. And not, not necessarily only men. I mean, XY chromosome people are dangerous. I understand that. <laughs> and sometimes unwise. But it's not only that. There's something else going on. Okay, go ahead, Gladys, you go. I've forgotten all this. Oh, you forgot. <laughs> See, if you talk long enough, they forget <laughs> the question. <laughs> no, okay, two, two things. things. Oh, sure. One, uh, don't you think Bill de Blasio was smart yesterday with his first campaign maneuver, or was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, when he went to meet with the realtors? Repeat. She said, was it strategically smart for Bill de Blasio to be meeting with the realty people? The answer is, in some ways, yes. It depends on what comes out of it. If you want to be the mayor, you've got to at least recognize and be informed about the concerns of diverse stakeholders and constituency. Do you have to accept what they tell you? No. Do you have to act on what they tell you? No. But you should certainly listen to them. Now, one could take a more... Uh, a this view of it, you know, he's sucking up to the money and he's going to be bored off like the rest of them. I mean, clearly, there are multiple things, but generally, I'm of the belief that you talk to everybody. You, you got to. And if they're throwing you a couple of, you know, $100,000 worth of cash, no, no, no. Only thousands. Only thousands. Go ahead. Second, Second question. To get back to uh, the leak kind of activities, what do you think of instant runoffs? <laughs> Very good question. Oh, instant. Okay. Okay. Let me let me give you some personal background. One of my one of my academic backgrounds is in the comparative analysis of voting systems, and I worked in the 1989 Charter Revision Commission. Jerry Benjamin, a professor at New Paltz, and I wrote the report on the City Council. And remember, this was the revolutionary uh, uh, charter. This is the charter that re really created modern New York City government after the <laughs> Supreme Court declared the voting system and the Board of Estimate unconstitutional. And one of the things that I did was I looked at every modern conceivable voting system out there. And our current first-past-the-post runoff system is terrible. It produces all kinds of adverse consequences. It violates a lot of criteria. And there is this move, certainly in the light of the public advocates race, which costs $13 million and has got a budget of 2.3 million. And lots of people say, do away with it because it shouldn't exist in the first place. We're not getting there. But the question then becomes, where do you go with all of that? Where do you, what, what then do you do? So you have this instant, uh, instant runoff voting, which is the hot thing put forward by fair vote. It's been adopted in any number of jurisdictions. Uh, the most, I guess, San Francisco being the, yeah. the largest and the most <laughs> recent, yeah. Oakland too, and, and, and Australia. This is a type of voting system that's known as the border system. And one of the problems with this system all systems, every, it is an axiom that all voting systems have deficiencies. They can't maximize all democratic values at the same time, since some are inherently contradictory. The problem with instant uh, vote, runoff voting is, and this is really technical, is that it's non-monotonic. And you, well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> well, the, the monotonicity principle, now I know this really, this is really the college professor talking. Let me talk to you about the monotonicity principle, my dear. 
what it says is that basically what instant runoff voting is is a, is, is a rank order system that you vote you you rank candidates in order of preference and what happens is you drop off in each round the lowest vote getter and redistribute their second third and fourth places depending down the line to voters the monotonicity says there shouldn't be any situations logical situations where Voters can rank a candidate higher on their ballot and have that candidate lose, while if they rank them lower, they would win. And that's perverse. Now the question becomes, how empirically frequent does this condition arise? And we don't have enough cases, but it seems to happen sometimes. Then the question becomes, well, is it better than what we've got even with this problem? And the answer generally is, Yes, but then there are all kinds of practical difficulties. The, the Board of Elections can't run a straightforward election. Yeah. <laughs> the question then becomes, can you put a, an I of V ballot on our current optical scanning machines? Yes. And the argument is, it can be. I want to see it work. You're all nodding your heads, yes. I want to see the Board of Elections actually put it into practice and see what the result is. I will bet you it'll take weeks to get a result. They do it in California. Yeah, excuse me, they do it in California. I'm saying, does the New York City Board of Election take the capability? So you're not addressing my question. Your answer is a non sequitur. So don't tell me about California, because it may be California dreaming over here. So yeah, it is possible to construct ballots. Is it possible to construct ballots on the optical scanning? Yes, suppose the answer is yes. Except the type is going to be so small that you're going to need, you know, Google glasses to, to, to view them. I mean, there's a lot of problems. So that's it. Maybe we'll get back together after the election. That's what I wanted. Really... I think that our students who took how to run for public office were the luckiest. And I hope that we give the course again and that you will be a member of our faculty again. Absolutely. So... Uh, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to get a little league atmosphere into the room. Mary Jenkins, our co-president, is going to give you some highlights of what we have done, where we're going, and introduce some of our outstanding co-chairs to you. So please pay attention. But remember, you'll be eating early. Thank you, Gladys. Um, I would first like to uh, tell you a little bit about something that's important, and all my papers seem to be falling off here. Um, we have a lot of these, which I hope that you'll all pick up uh, several copies of and distribute to your friends, and um, you know we can pass them around soon. In addition to that, we have our voter's guide, which this is part two, voter's guide, which uh, describes the six propositions that you'll be voting on in December, in, in November, sorry, November 5th. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we always like to, to know what's on the ballot before we walk in and uh, stand there and try to read that fine print. So if you'll pick up, again, we have lots of these flyers, and if you'll pick up uh, multiple copies to distribute to your family, friends, any other organizations that you belong to, I think they'll find it useful. We also have the Spanish translation. So if you have friends and family who speak Spanish and would rather have it in Spanish, you can get that as well. And just to kind of give you a quick rundown on these proposals, the first one deals with casino uh, gambling. Uh, the second one with giving veterans civil service credit. Uh, the third one excludes communities from debt limits for construction of sewage facilities. And the next two have to do with land exchanges uh, upstate, 
Uh, but the last one I think will be of interest here in the city. It has to do with extending the age of judges to 80. At, at present, uh, they must retire at age 70. So that's um, an issue that you might want to look at. Okay, um, first I would like to introduce our special debates coordinator. She's going to tell you about some upcoming debates. Laura Altshuler. Laura? That, we're, that we will be involved in. Well, it's a city election year, so the City League is very busy. Um, the first thing you should make note of, for those of you who don't know, um, w on October 15th, that's a Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. on WABC Channel 7, um, we are co-sponsoring, along with Univision and the New York Daily News, the mayoral debate. It's the first mayoral debate that will be held before the election. And, and we were the first for the primaries, and which had the most viewership. So we're hoping to continue that track record. So uh, for those of you Jeopardy lovers, you're out of luck, because on Tuesday evening, on October 15th from 7 to 8, it will be the mayoral debates. And we're also working on uh, Manhattan City Council and Borough President general election debates. They will be on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. They will be taped next week, and they will be aired a number of times. There are eight city council districts in Manhattan out of the 10 that are contested races, and uh, the winner of the Democratic primary will be running against a variety of candidates. There are some Green Party in a few districts, the Republican Party. There's a new dump, the dump party, which I had never heard of before. But that happens every election year. You get some traditional names of existing uh, political parties in uh, New York uh, State. And then we get, in city elections, uh, people try to get their names on the ballot. So. Um, and there will be a borough president debate uh, because, as you know, Gail Brewer won the Democratic primary and there is a Republican uh, who will be running against her, so we're scheduling that debate. As I said, they're all going to be um, taped next week and then they will be aired the following week and you will be able, and, and right up to election day. What Manhattan Neighborhood Network does is um, provide access to the debates on a number of occasions. And as it is frequently your local elected officials that you sometimes have more contact with than you might with the President of the United States, I think it's always important that you know who your council members are and how to reach them and how to access them. And so I think we're providing a service. For those of you who like to watch things on your computers, there's always a link then to the MNN debates so you can watch it then at any time uh, once they're on. And uh, that's what keep, what's keeping us busy for this particular election. Thank you. Now we're gonna hear from our various committees, advocacy committees. And first, uh, I'd like to call up Arthur Schiff and Rosemary Shields, who are the co-chairs of the Campaign Finance Committee. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Rosemary and I were members of, uh, of the Campaign Finance Reform Committee last year, and of course the League has had uh, a long involvement in attempting to reform the, um, the U.S. and the New York State and the New York City campaign finance laws, uh, feeling that um, there's too much money in politics and it's got too much influence over, uh, over the policies that our elected officials uh, end up supporting. In New York State, uh, New York State has um, some of the worst um, campaign finance laws in the country. Uh, of all the states that regulate the amount that people can donate to uh, candidates for office. New York State is by permits by far the most money to be donated to candidates. Uh, 
There have been attempts over the last several years to uh, reform the laws. Uh, Governor Cuomo uh, uh, introduced legislation last year. Uh, the State Assembly passed legislation over the last several years, uh, largely to um, reform the state laws uh, on the model of the New York City uh, public financing model, where there is matching funds given to candidates who, who run. Uh, that, that, uh, that model was tried at the state level last year. Uh, it was passed in the assembly. The governor supported it, but the, uh, the state senate uh, ended up not, not voting on it, and so the session expired uh, without, without uh, any legislation being adopted. There is hope, though, for uh, the coming year. Uh, uh, and the Campaign Finance Reform Committee, Rosemary and I's committee, um, uh, are, are hoping to be um, uh, advocates for, for reform this coming year. Our first meeting is planned for November 20th, uh, next month. Uh, that's a Wednesday. And it starts at 1, one o'clock in the afternoon uh, here in the league offices upstairs. Uh, we, uh, we expect um, uh, a very active uh, uh, committee uh, session and uh, uh, program going forward through the uh, legislative session, which lasts from January to June. And so we are very hopeful of getting a, a good turnout of, of members. We have a number of members, but uh, we're certainly inviting as many more who would like to, uh, to join that as, as possible. Rosemary, do you have anything you want to no, add? No, just to say that anybody who's interested in even finding, finding out about the committee, I've got some background information, websites where you can go to get background information to do your homework before Wednesday, November 20th at 1 o'clock because even though the legislature is out but the Moreland Commission is in, on, you know, we need to get ourselves uh, committed, informed so that we're ready come January after the budget, then we'll be able to really uh, work some magic. League magic. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So if anybody's Thank interested. You.